Hello, I'm Stephen Groom. Welcome to Let God Speak. We're bombarded with messages every day of our lives. Buy this, do that. But God has a message for our time also, a life-changing, hope-generating, life-saving message. Our Bible study today will reveal this. On our panel today, we have Nathan Tasker and Gail Fong. Welcome to Let God Speak. Thank you, Steve. Thank Let you. us begin with prayer before we start. Let's bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll be with us. Help us as panelists to um, get this message, important message mm. that is worth sharing and help the audience to understand this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God has a special message for everyone, every nation, language, group, and culture. First, first up, Nathan, what is the core of this message? Wow, that's a really good question, isn't it? And my mind is thinking in uh, quite a number of different directions. But the thing that strikes me as really special about God and his message for us is that it seems to be pretty inclusive. It seems to include everybody men and women, boys and girls, and even sometimes the animals and the, the natural world as well. In a particular passage here, 1 John 2 verse 2, uh, it says that he, that is uh, Jesus himself, is the satisfaction, a fancy word here, propitiation. He is what it takes to uh, sort out our problems, our sins. And not only for us, the text says, it's for the entire world. So it's really uh, encouraging to know that it's not just a small group for a particular group of people, but it's for everybody. Yeah, so, so we like to say it's the atoning death, meaning that he died for everyone. He wasn't just dying for a select group, was it? Is, um, is there more to this message, Gail? Uh, yes, there is more. I think Revelation, um, John actually, John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3. It's a wonderful, comforting promise and assurance there from Jesus himself. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And Jesus wouldn't make a promise without fulfilling it because he keeps all his promises. So he will come back. He will return to take home his purchase, those whom he has purchased by his precious blood. And he's longing to take his loved ones home. And I find that very comforting. Yes. And it's, um, yeah, it's he a wonderful message He doesn't want to leave us in this share. sin sick world, does he? And I like the way he begins. He says, don't be troubled. He cares about our feelings, our troubles. Yes. And he wants to let us know and comfort us with the thought that he's going to take us to a better place, doesn't he? Amen. Yes. It's like a first aid course. You know, the first thing you'd want to do is make sure that the patient knows it's going to be all right. We, we have it under control the best way we can. And God, of course, definitely has things under control. Yes, he does. Amen. And on that point, I'd like to take us to Second Peter um, mm. chapter 1 and verse 12. And um, it begins with wherefore. Now, wherefore means on, it means um, on the basis of what I've previously, previously said, that, um, that an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour will be richly provided for you. And he says in verse 12, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. So what does Peter mean by present truth, Nathan? Wow. <laughs> it, it seems like truth is an important concept and Pilate asks, what is truth? But I guess the question we would have is, what's in it for me today? How does this cash out in my day to day, in my daily word? And it seems interesting to me 
that God has a bit of a track record of talking to people before stuff happens. I want to just uh, look, if I could, briefly at a couple of passages. Amos 3 verse 7. Amos was just a shepherd, by the way, a fairly humble person, but good at his job. And God picked him and said, go to uh, across the border to where they're not very friendly and tell them a a message that I have. (laughs) That's quite common for the people he chooses in the Bible, isn't it? Yes, yes. And it was a dangerous thing because Amos was being sent to a place where people would kill um, messengers like Amos. Okay. And he wasn't a preacher or a pastor or a clergyman. He was he was a a, a farmer. I think he grew. um, Was it? um, some fig trees. fig trees and I think a shepherd as well, perhaps. Anyway, he says here, this is Amos 3 verse 7, uh, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. And Isaiah picks up on this theme, talking, I guess, on behalf of God, a pretty bold claim here. Just listen to this. It's pretty powerful. This is Isaiah 46 verses uh, 9 to 11. Remember the former things long past, for I am the Lord and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. And how does he back this up? He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. This is a pretty audacious claim. This yeah. is a God who isn't just out there in the periphery somewhere. He's getting his hands on it and saying, I'm going to talk and then it's going to happen. Oh, I get three things from that. He cares for us. He knows the end for the beginning and that he has a, a message for, for everyone. Mm. Is that right? And um, well, I guess what Peter was saying too is Christ has come. Yes. He had come. Yes. That was definitely present truth. And on that point, when the New Testament was written, Christ's sacrificial death at that first advent was present truth. Um, What is present truth today, Gail? Well, the message of salvation in Jesus is never out of date. Um, It's present truth for every generation. It's a message of his everlasting love. It's a message of his abounding Mm. grace. It's a message of his eternal truth. And um, I guess in Revelation... Uh, Just turn to Revelation chapter 1 there. Um, John, he speaks of it this way in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And he says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So revelation being a revelation of Jesus Christ, and actually the first chapter there, um, it describes great events that are relevant and urgent um, events that will be leading up to this promise that Jesus made that he will come again. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, uh, John writes, Behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they that pe- who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Yes. And in fact, the whole chapter of verse one is a is a revealing is a descri- different descriptions of Jesus. We look at uh, verse five. He was a, called a faithful witness. Mm. He doesn't tell lies, can he? No. He says he's going to come again. He will. Um, yeah. Verse eight, he says the he's called the Alpha and Omega. Verse 13, he's the one standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks ministering on our behalf. So he is hard at work seeking everyone's salvation, isn't it? I like the concept too. I, maybe, it, maybe I'm um, imagining it here, but I see a, a similarity here with the God who heard the people crying out in suffering in, in ancient Egypt. Yeah. Uh, Lord, please help us. We are under tremendous adversity here. And even in Revelation, uh, those um, martyrs under the altar, the voice crying out, how long the blood of Abel calling up from the earth uh, symbolically to God. Yes looking for justice. And it seems like the whole point here is God is saying, you've waited long enough. I need to come and uh, enact the rescue mission because my children have suffered long enough. And I I think for all of us here, whether we're believers or not, this is really exciting, really positive news because Mm -hmm. we get to to have what we've been looking for fulfilled. Yes. And um, the book of Revelation, it's it's called actually the Apocalyptus in in Greek, um, can be described 
by many as a difficult book to understand. What would you say is, Nathan, is Revelation's primary focus? <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess ultimately there's, there's a big battle between good and evil, but there's a, I, I guess looking back just a bit before we come to the battle, Isaiah chapter 2 is probably the, one of the most quoted parts in our modern pop culture today. You know, the, the concept of looking for peace, looking for nations to no longer be waving their swords, but to beat them into plowshares, mm. to see all the nations come together and not know about war anymore. You know, we've, had, we've got pop songs from Michael Jackson and Don Henley. The United Nations has got this quote emblazoned twice around the UN building uh, in New York. All of us are talking about this. Three US presidents uh, had the same quote. And God says, I'm going to come and bring peace, but there's going to have to be a showdown because there's an adversary who says, I don't want this peace. I don't want God to bring peace and justice to the world. So I guess Revelation is the final struggle between two entities. One saying, I want to restore my people. And another usurper saying, I want to try and stop that. Yes. Um, Gail, can you give us any other significant features in the message of Revelation for us? Uh, yes, we could. There are other significant features. We could go to Revelation chapter 11, chapter 11. and verse 15 to 18. Uh, it's actually the seventh under the seventh trumpet, the kingdom proclaimed. And just reading there, it says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign, reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. There's quite a lot in that. Yes. But um, uh, there is the investigative judgment that would happen prior to the return of Jesus. And, and that's different from the executive judgment where he, he hands out rewards and punishments. Is that right? Uh, yes, this will happen prior to his return so that when he comes, his yes. rewards are with the Investigative him. judgment. Yes, yes, in the investigative judgment. Um, and you were sharing this before, and I thought this is amazing that verse 18, it's a, um, it's a, springboard, it's a springboard verse or passage, passage yeah. because um, it's a summary of the second half of the book of Revelation. Yes. So like you might read in a book where the author will give you a glimpse of what's to come. John is giving us a glimpse of the final chapters of the book of Revelation. Mm. Yes. I guess part of that glimpse, too, is how this cashes out for those who don't want God and his government to reign. Of course, there's lots of sim uh, symbolism used here. So as we read through the text, we're trying to put it out our decoding thinking caps. But the, the concept of the nations uh, raging here, Revelation chapter 19, if you have your Bibles handy, you might want to have a look at uh, Revelation 19, 11 to 15. My Bible has a subheading here, the coming of Christ. And it talks about this, this, this vision or this picture of heaven opening and a white horse and somebody very significant sitting on this horse. This is someone who is called faithful and true and righteousness. He judges and wages war. This is not punitive or coming to you know, stake some sort of a territory, like a colonial kind of a war. This is a war of... Um, I don't want to use the word independence, <laughs> but this is, this is a war of bringing freedom to God's people, yes. of rescuing them from a tremendous hardship that they've been, all of us uh, have been stuck in for so long. Verse 12, 13, 14 talks a bit about what he looks like. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Kind of a funny picture, but in those days, the sword was the way 
that things were decided in judgment or in, you know, in a context. And, and the sword is used in other places to represent the word of God, isn't it? Not, not, yes, yeah. yes. Certainly in the book of Ezekiel, for example, the sword is used to divide the prophet's hair. The hair, of course, representing the, the various um, groups of people that would be scattered um, during that particular time. So verse 15, from his mouth comes a, sh- a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with the rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. Now, I think it's important as we read those words in a modern context to realize that this is not some, um, you know, violence crazed individual. This is someone who, like a, a mother bear caring for her cubs. It's been too long. There's been too much suffering going on. Enough is enough. God is very patient. And it's in love for his people that he yeah. is uh, destroying the wicked. That's right. Anything else, Gail, you'd like to add to that? Uh-huh. Well, there is other um, uh, areas we could go to, Revelation 17, verse 14. And there we read, um, there, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. So the powers of earth will war with the Lamb and, um, and the Lamb's believers, but God will deliver His people. Yes. And why do you think that God is giving this future in advance, so to speak? I I would like to perhaps uh, suggest that there's a appeal that God is giving here to the world. He's not just merely telling us how it's going to end for 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 grins and giggles. He's saying, I want to tell you about it so that you can be equipped and do something about it. All of us care about like the weather forecast today. If it's going to rain, I get my umbrella. If, if I care about uh, finances or the stock market, I might, if I had that kind of <laughs> wherewithal, I might be uh, repositioning myself. God is asking us here to make some decisions. Uh, Revelation 22, there's a couple of uh, verses I'd like to look at with you. Revelation chapter 22, verse uh, 7 says, this is Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who listens to the words of the prophecy of this book. And why on earth would there be a blessedness for paying attention? Verse 17 goes on. The spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. It's not even... There's not even a transaction required here. It's just fresh on offer. And no matter how bad a situation might be in this earth at any time, God is showing us in the future that if we accept him, you know, all things will work out the best at the end. But we must move on. I like the way that John makes it clear that salvation is available in the end times. But Christians have been waiting for the second coming of Jesus for a long time, haven't they, Gail? Yes, they have. And even though it's a couple of thousand years on since the Bible was completed, um, being written, um, he's coming quickly. Yes. And even if it's only in a, only a lifetime away, if we, yes. if we go to rest before he comes, it's only a lifetime away. So our last away. breath is basically the second coming. We're whisked to his either the second or third coming. Yes. And we want um, to make sure it's the second coming for the righteous, isn't it? Unless we have the privilege of being alive yeah. and seeing mm. him come. But I want to move to the core of the book, the message for the Revelation. It's Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Um, can you tell us about that, Nathan? I guess there's a picture here of an angel flying in the heavens with a very urgent uh, message, the, the first of the three angels' messages. And it says... Uh, in verse 7, this angel is, is yelling out with a loud voice. I'm not a Greek uh, scholar, maybe you can correct me, but I think the word is megaphone. Megaphone. There, is it? Yeah, yeah, like a megaphone. Fear God or respect God. Give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Yep. It's very important, isn't it? Um, and there's a related point in Revelation 22:12, Gail. Yes, there is. Uh, in, in that verse, it says, And behold, again, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according 
to his uh, work. So there's this um, aspect of a, a investigation or a, a judgment that's happening before he comes because when Jesus comes, he's bringing his rewards with and him. And that's important, is it? Because how we live now relates yes. to whether we receive a reward at the end or... Eternal life. Or, exactly. Yes. That's very important. <laughs> Amen. How relevant is the symbol of harvest that Jesus used in Matthew 13, 37 to 39, Nathan? I think it's powerful because people can relate to it and it also has a, a, a sign of urgency. When the harvest comes, it needs to be dealt with. You can't let the harvest just sit there for a few weeks and deal with it later because it will go off and go rotten. You miss the chance. So there's a sense of urgency and the symbolism here is easy for us to understand. Yeah. And after the harvest, they have to sift the wheat, don't they? And that's like judgment language. Mm. He sifts the, the husks from the, from the precious grain. Yes. And, and that's a very important metaphor in the Bible. Do these sobering messages still contain hope, Gail? Yes, they do. And as, um, as has already been mentioned there, that the final message, it is an appeal there in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. As John sees another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, we have a message worth sharing. We have a message worth holding on to because that everlasting gospel, it speaks of acceptance and mm. forgiveness and grace and uh, life changing power, a sense of belonging, because we have a God who came down from heaven. He, he expended everything to come down here to rescue rescue us at whatever cost and it cost him his life. So it's a wonderful message. And as it goes on, the appeal there as in verse seven, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountain, the springs of water. It, who wouldn't want to respect and obey a God who shows so much love? Certainly. And, and to be on the positive side of the ju uh, judgment, what does um, what do we have to do? And, and it's reflected in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. I'll just uh, turn there if you like. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Nathan, would you like to read the conclusion of the so, matter for us? So it says here, uh, respect or fear God. Some translations say fear God, keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Mm. Does that show any light on fearing God, Gail? Yes, I do think that God is interested in how we live. And um, when you love him, you would naturally want him to be the center of your life. And think of another verse in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 and uh, 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So when you fall in love with Jesus, you would naturally want him to be Lord of your life. And yes. in every as everything that you do, say and think and how you live your life, you would want to live for the yes. glory of God. In, in Revelation 14, 7, there is a mention here of worship. It says here, worship the one having made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. What is God saying here, Nathan? I think he's inviting us to remember how things once were, how God made things and how God visions himself and us interacting together. This isn't a, a fear mongering kind of a, you know, surrender or else, but this is an invitation to commune with God as he originally intended. I think that's an exciting opportunity to revisit. Yes, thank you for that. Um, talking of obedience, that, which we were before, um, this is a quote from one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? The fear. Yes, it is. Um, Worship him who made heaven and earth. Yes, it is, um, Stephen. It's in the heart of God's law. The commandment, the fourth commandment actually fourth says, commandment. remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And who and when we worship definitely sends out a message. Uh, and to worship on the, to worship on the Sabbath, the, the day that God has set aside, I'm acknowledging God as my creator. Yes, that's, that's important, isn't it? Yeah. The day he specified. Yes. We don't want to miss a date with him. Now, there's also a second message 
um, Revelation 14, 8, that says it's another angel. It says a second one followed him saying, Fallen, fallen Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Um, in, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 13, 20 and Jeremiah 50, 39, it says Babylon would be destroyed and never be inhabited. But here we see at the end, end time that it's, it's, uh, it's happening again. Will it be rebuilt in northern Iraq again, Nathan? We've certainly tried, haven't we? Or at least uh, our friend Saddam has tried. It's a pity we can't spend more time on this one today, but I invite my sceptical friends to just uh, have a think about uh, Isaiah 13 and Jeremiah's predictions. But clearly this passage in Revelation is figurative. And if we were to look at the etymology or the background of the word uh, Babylon, yep. we'd find out that it actually means uh, the gate of the gods, uh, the polytheistic gods of the Babylonians, Babelu. But the Hebrews made fun of this and said, now it means confusion. You know, they, they have, it's a word play in the, in the Hebrew. So we're talking about a, an entity or a group that is opposed to God rather than a literal ancient city. Yeah. So um, this Babylon is, is rebel actually rebellion against God, isn't it? It's the bad side in, in Revelation, which is opposed to Jerusalem. Um, what happens to Babylon, Gail? Well, it says in Revelation 14 and verse 8 under the second angel that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Has that happened yet? It's happening. I believe it. I believe that um, yeah. Babylon is falling, is falling, because we've got man's traditions and Satan's lies that are actually being that are actually out there today. And then we have Revelation 18 and uh, in verse two, it, it's like the final, final message there, which says Babylon the great. Um, and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. The same message and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. So yes, um, it's fallen and, and exposed at the time. And, and God is telling this because he wants his people to come out of these false religions yes. and join his people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, doesn't he? Amen. What stands out for you in these verses, Gail? Well, I see that we have a message worth sharing and it's, it's about who we worship and the day we worship. Okay, thanks for that. So the message is for us to make a simple decision. Are we worshipping the creator on the day he appointed or are we worshipping the beast on a day he appointed? Whose authority will we acknowledge? The choice is ours. We are glad you joined us today on Let God Speak. You can watch any past programs on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. Teachers will find notes there to download. You can send us emails at lgs at 3abnaustralia.org.au. Do join us again next time. God bless. Mm. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.